and the um, <clears throat> steps are therefore, when we look at a crystal, quite impossible to see. So the sides of a crystal built like that, this arrangement of cubic unit soles would seem to be us to us to be quite smooth. Now, those 32 basically different shapes are grouped into six crystal systems, as we say. And here are representatives of two of those crystal systems, the cubic and the hexagonal. And the basically different shapes which belong to these two different crystal systems are characterized by certain what we call planes and axes of symmetry. That is, planes which divide the crystal into um, <coughs> regular shapes. For example, this is a cube and there is a plane of symmetry. In other words, if we take a knife and we chop the cube in half, we have a right hand and a left hand mirror image the same way as if you were to chop me down the middle. There'd be a right and a left half. So there's a plane of symmetry right through the center of a, of a person and right through the center of a cube. There are others in a cube as well. There's one across here. There's one across there, one across there, one across the middle, one down there, one down there. There are many planes of symmetry which one can cut through to form two symmetrical mirror image parts of a cube. Now, cube is easy. Um, to do it with different shapes would be rather complicated, and we shan't do that. We'll stick to demonstrating the planes of symmetry with a cube. There are also um, <coughs> elements of symmetry that we call axes. And an axis of symmetry is an axis, or if you like, like an axle in a, in a car, around which we can rotate the crystal and see similar faces. So in a cube, we can rotate the, uh, the shape around an axis that goes straight through the middle, rather like a knitting needle. And in order for a crystal shape to belong to the cubic crystal system, it must have certain axes of symmetry. And we can demonstrate these with this model in which all the important axes are shown. There is the one around which we rotated this model, that is here. There's this one around which we can rotate the cube. And then there's also this one around which we can rotate it. There are three axes then of symmetry to the quartz, uh, to, the, to the cube, which characterize the cubic crystal system. This is a, another shape, which at first doesn't look obviously cubic, which also has three axes, one, two, and three. So this shape belongs also to the cubic crystal system. Now it's important when looking at the shapes not to be misled by the overall impression What's important is that one look at the angles between the various faces. We can demonstrate this with reference to the hexagonal crystal system to which quartz belongs. In this case, this is a quartz crystal which is quite perfect in shape. And if we were to take a slice out of it and measure the angles between the faces, here, we'd find it was 120 degrees. And we can see that very well on the cross section. 120 degrees between perfectly developed faces, all of equal size. But consider this example. The only difference between this shape and this one is that the crystal faces are of different size. The angle between them is not different. So the angle between this long face and this short one is 120 degrees, the same as it was 120 degrees here. And the same with this shape, which at first is not obviously hexagonal. This face and this face form an angle of 120 degrees. And the same with this shape here. So 
it's important then to examine the angles between the faces of crystals. The way that we do this is to take a crystal, here is a crystal of quartz, and to put the crystal against an instrument we call a goniometer. And in this case, we'd measure 120 degrees, 120, 120. So that gives you an idea of the way in which we arrange different crystal shapes into groups that we call systems. Now, we've been looking at the crystals themselves, their external form, their shapes. Minerals usually occur in rocks, and in this case, we can't see the crystal form, and we must look at the minerals with a microscope. It's quite a different way of looking at minerals. And in order to look at the minerals that are in rocks, we usually use a microscope. And it's necessary first to prepare what we call a thin section. The first step is to cut a slice from the rock using a diamond-edged saw. The slices are then cemented to glass slides and ground until they're paper thin. The resulting thin sections allow light to pass through them quite easily and can be examined then under the microscope. When we look at a thin section of rock under the microscope, we generally employ polarized light, which we produce by using two sheets of Polaroid. Now, you're familiar with this material as a material which produces uh, good sunglasses. In the microscope, we use two sheets. If we have them in both in the same direction, we see nothing. Rotate one, the light comes through. Rotate again, black. Each sheet of Polaroid cuts out the light vibrating in one direction, a rather peculiar material. One sheet of Polaroid is in here in the microscope, another is beneath here, and the thin section between has the effect of twisting and bending the light, and the net result of this is that each mineral grain in the rock, when we look down the microscope, is characterized by a different color. In this thin section of an igneous rock, the interlocking nature of the grains is seen quite clearly. The polarized light causes the quartz grains to be black and white and shades of gray, and the large lath-shaped crystal in the center of the screen is biotite. And the black lines along its length are the cleavage. Using polarized light makes the crystals very much more clear than in plain light, when the thin section looks colorless. So the mineral grains in igneous rocks are interlocking which is what we'd expect from a rock that had cooled from a molten fluid. We look at igneous rocks and the minerals they contain in more detail next week. But in the meantime, I hope you will have carefully unpacked and studied your mineral kit. Take the specimens out simply by slitting the plastic. It's best to take them out one at a time so you can get the correct numbers on the specimens. And in order to store them, you might like to try an old egg box. unit is, I think, the most exciting of the 22 in the series. It's, for you, very much a relaxation from the slog of learning mineral names and learning how to classify igneous rocks and learning new geological jargon. It's a unit that deals with the big idea of geology, the unifying theory that represents to geology what evolution represents to biology. It's the theory of plate tectonics the realization